church. I welcome you as you welcome me to in Jesus' name. What a day to be together again that God will make an Isaiah out of you in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you and we love you. We praise you, we glorify your name. We thank you because you keep us alive for your glory, for your work. And we pray, Lord, that this work will prosper in every one of our hands in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. Be glorified in every life tonight. In Jesus' name, we pray. We're coming to Isaiah. And we're reading from Isaiah chapter 6, reading from verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. When he said, I there, I saw also the Lord. That's talking about Isaiah. He saw the Lord sitting upon his throne. And it says, his train filled the temple. It tells us in verse 2. It says in verse 2, he's uh, talking about the vision he saw. The glory of the Lord and the angel, the seraphims and everyone that he saw. And he saw the holiness of God and the goodness of God and the greatness of God. He says in verse 2, above stood the seraphims, each one at six wings with twain he covered his face and with twain he covered his feet and with twain he did fly then in verse 3 it says and one cried unto another and said holy 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 the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. He gives us an inkling of the Trinity here. Even when he says, uh, when the Word of God says, who will go for us? Us, in the plural, is talking about the Trinity. The three in one. And it says, they cried one to another and said, Holy, 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 is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. Look at verse 4. In verse 4, it tells us, and the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then in verse 5, here is now the declaration of Isaiah, the confession of Isaiah, the desire of Isaiah. He wanted to be cleansed, he wanted to be blood, he wanted to be purified and prepared for the service of the Lord for the work the Lord has given him and, and said then said I woe it's me for I am undone because I am a man of unclean leaves and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean leaves for mine eyes have, have seen the king the Lord of hosts then in verse 6 it says then flew one of the seraphims unto me having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongues from off the altar. Verse 7. In verse 7, he says, And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy leaves, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin upon. When you look at uh, Isaiah and you look at the Bible in general, uh, sin has two forms. Sins in the plural, those are the things we do, the sins of commission, the sins of omission. Those are the transgressions, the iniquities. And it says all that your sins and your iniquity taken away and put the sin in the singular is the very root. Is the, very, is the depravity of the heart. The sin on the inside, the internal sin and deviation from the standard of the Lord. And the sins in the plural when they are forgiven, that is salvation. And the sin in the singular when it's taken away, when it is poured, when it is uprooted, that's referring to sanctification and after that experience of the sin being taken away and the sin being poured, it tells us in verse 8, and it says, and I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Whom shall I send? The unity of God. 
who will go for us the plurality in the Godhead that he is three in one three united into one that's the Trinity whom shall I say and who will go for us then said I here I am send me the Lord is still asking the question today he still has the project he still has the commission he still has the great commission he wants us to take into the rest of the world and he's still asking whom shall I send and who will go for us and we need to answer like I say here am I send me we need to identify with I say we need to have the same experience that I say had. we need to have the go a false event or declaration or commission that I say uh, that's why we're asking the question today can you become another another I say uh, we normally sing make me an Elijah today another Elijah or they say this we sing these are the days of Ezekiel and these are the days of Joel because we want their lives their experience we want their life their power we want their life their passion to be reproduced in us that's why the topic today is becoming another Isaiah, the Messiah's prophet, the Messiah's prophet. Isaiah talked a lot about the Lord, about the Messiah, about his birth, about his virgin conception and birth, about the gospel, the kingdom that he came to establish, about the Gentiles that will trust in him, about his death at Calvary, and about his resurrection. He spoke about his coming again, his second coming. And so the same commission the Lord has given to us, like he gave to Isaiah. That's why we're saying becoming another Isaiah, the Messiah's prophet, the Messiah's proclaimer, the Messiah's preacher, that God will put the same power and the same spirit in every one of us so that, like I say, we're on with the gospel message. Look at Isaiah chapter 8, and we're looking at verse 18. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 18, Behold, I, I am the children whom the Lord has given me. I am the disciples whom the Lord has given me. I am the servants of God whom the Lord has given me. Say, for wonders were for signs and for wonders in Israel, in the land, in the country now, in every nation, from the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth in Mount Zion. Is telling us that it's not only it's not the only one. I and the children, I and the people, I and the sons and the daughters of God that God has given me. We are for signs and for wonders in Israel. It tells us in Hebrews chapter two, reading from verse eleven. It says, "For both He that sanctifies and they who are sanctified." are all of one. Was Isaiah sanctified? Yes, he and the one sanctified, the sanctifier and the sanctified. Was he purged? Was he prepared for a further ministry, for a greater ministry? Yes, but not only himself. I and the sons, I and the servants, I and the disciples that the Lord, I and the converts that the Lord has given me were for signs and wonders in Israel, even from henceforth unto the coming of the Lord. We're looking at verse 12. In verse 12, it says, saying, I will declare thy name unto, the, unto my brethren in the midst of the church will I praise, sing praise unto thee. Verse 13 now is taken from Isaiah. In verse 13, and again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God has given me. That means then we come to Isaiah. And we identify with Isaiah. I want the same power, the same spirit, and the same calling of Isaiah upon our lives today. Becoming another Isaiah, 
the Messiah's prophet. We're looking at three points here. Number one, we're looking at the we're looking at the corruption, the condemnation, and the cleansing of the people. The corruption, that's what I just spoke about. And the condemnation is spoke about that. And now he talked about the cleansing of the people. Number two is the coming, the crucifixion, and the conquest of the prince. The prince of peace that has all power that came to this world so as to become the propitiation for our sins and then came so that he will be crucified for our guilt and then they will conquer because he is the seed of the woman the virgin born Christ that is good to conquer the devil the coming the crucifixion and the conquest of the prince look at number three number three is the consecration the confirmation and the continuation of the prophet. It, we, talk, we talk about his consecration. Here am I, he sent me. He laid himself on the altar and he absolutely surrendered himself, his life, his gift, everything to the Lord. Here am I, he sent me. And in the confirmation of his word, you find all over the New Testament, as I say, I said, as I say, I prophesied, as I said, the prophet declared the word of Isaiah was confirmed. And then number three, the continuation of that of the prophet and the continuation in us, the continuation through us and the continuation by the people who are preaching the gospel without fear, without favor today. Come to number one. Number one is the corruption condemnation and the cleansing of the people. We're looking at it on three, at three levels. Number one, the corruption of the religious people. Number two, the condemnation of revealed pride. Number three is the cleansing through redemptive purging. We're looking at number one. Number one is the corruption of the religious people. It tells us in Isaiah chapter one, we're reading from verse two. Isaiah chapter one, verse two, hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. Yet the prophet Isaiah is revealing to the nation the sins of the nation, the corruption of the nation. If we're going to be like Isaiah, if we're going to preach like Isaiah, if we're going to lift up the Lord like Isaiah, we cannot keep quiet. Our mouth must not be muscled. We must not be so silent because of the fear of the people. We must declare what the Lord is declaring about the sinful world in which we live that have brought up a child, the children and they have rebelled against me. Look at verse 3. In verse 3, it tells us the ox knoweth his own arm, and the, the, the ass, the master's grief. But Israel does not know, my people does not consider. Look at verse 4. In verse 4, it says, a ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evil doers, children that are corruptors. They were corrupt on the inside, and then their lives, their action, their interaction corrupted other people. The example, the pattern of life, everything they did was done to corrupt other people until corruption went from one to two, from two to four, from four to eight, and from eight to sixteen, and eventually covered the whole of the nation because there was corruption in them, and they spread the corruption everywhere. Everything they touched was corrupted. Every word they did was 
corrupted and every interaction they had corrupted those other people are sinful nation the seed of evil doers children that are corrupt as they are forsaking the Lord they have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger they are gone the way backward and then he tells us in verse reading there in verse 5 it says why should you be stricken anymore you will revolt more and more and the whole head is sick and the whole heart faint oh you say maybe they were no more religious because we were religious before but not because there's no religion that's the reason why they were corrupt and were corrupted and corruption was their very life look at verse 12 in verse 12 it tells us it says when ye come to appear before me they were still attending their sanctuary they were still attending their temple worship they were still attending their synagogue and he said when you come to appear before me who has required this at your hand to Stretch my cause. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, it says, Bring no more vain oblations. It says, Incense is an abomination unto me. It says, The new moons and Sabbath, 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 the calling of assemblies I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn feast. It tells us in verse 14, in verse 14, your new moon, your new moon and uh, your appointed fees my soul hated they are a trouble unto me I am weary to bear them verse 15 tells us it says when you spread your hand forth your hands I will hide mine eyes from you yea when you make many prayers I will not here, your hands are full of blood. They were religious people. But even though they were religious, they were corrupt. How many people today might, you know, uh, be members of a good church, a Bible-believing church, or any other church, and yet as religious as they are, they are corrupted in mind, they are corrupted in heart, they are corrupted in action, they are corrupted in their language, they are corrupted in their dressing and appearance. And the Lord is saying, there is corruption in the land. And it's not just on the street. It's not among the atheists, the people who don't believe there is God. There is corruption among religious people too. It tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, reading from verse 33, it says, uh, we, we ought to know that be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. And there are people who are saved, but their closest friends are unbelievers. There are people who claim to be sanctified, but their familiar friends, familiar people, are people with corrupt language, corrupt life, corrupt appearance, corrupt, corrupt disposition. They will be corrupted eventually. And if nothing is done, corruption will sweep all the churches, and corruption will sweep the whole of society. It says in verse 34, in verse 34, it says awake unto righteousness corruption is there awake come out of that corrupt uh, corruption and repent and turn to the lord it says awake to righteousness and sin not for some have not the knowledge of god they hear about salvation they do not hear they do not know they do not have the knowledge of the justice of god of the holiness of god they do not understand of the plan of god to judge the whole world they do not have the knowledge of god uh, i speak this to your shame the shame of religious people the shame of bible reading people the shame of bible carrying people the shame of people that hold the truth in unrighteousness it said corruption is in the land and it wants us to go to the lord for the purging for the pardon and for the purifying of the corruption in second peter i'm looking at chapter 2 second peter chapter 2 verse 19 while they promised them 
liberty. Those are preachers, preachers, they're promising, they're here as liberty. They themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought into bondage and that's what is happening among many people the preachers they can talk of freedom they can talk of prosperity they can talk of you know we are the people and we are going to inherit the land they can go up and down eh, like the pharisees but the corruption is in their lives in the private as well as in the public and it's telling us that we should not just uh, turn our eyes the other way we should understand anywhere there is corruption there's going to be condemnation look at number two here number two is the condemnation of revealed pride the condemnation of revealed pride uh, look right left forward back you see pride everywhere even the poor people are proud and the people that have nothing they are proud and the people you will think they should be on their knees pleading and begging the lord for the grace of god to come into their lives no everyone is proud that's why he's saying in Isaiah chapter 2, reading from verse 12, Isaiah chapter 2, verse 12, For the day of the Lord of hosts shall uh, be upon everyone that is proud, everyone that is proud and lofty, and upon everyone that is lifted up, and he shall the broad low. There was pride in the land of Israel. Even though they were corrupt, even though they were not righteous, even though God looked down on them and everything they did was not acceptable unto the Lord, yet the pride was there. And if, you, if we look at her personal lives, and if we look at our meager possessions, if we look at our low knowledge, if we look at our life, even though we are low, you still see pride in every place. Look at verse 17. In verse 17, he's still talking about the condemnation of their pride, which was revealed everywhere. And the loftiness of man shall be bowed, shall be bowed down, and the Hotiness of men shall be made low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. Uh, how, how did they manifest their pride? How was their pride revealed? Revealed to their neighbors, revealed to their community, revealed in the nation, and revealed to everyone. Look at Isaiah chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 16. Isaiah chapter 3, we're looking at verse 16. It tells us, it say, moreover, the Lord says, this is the Lord talking about the nation, and this is Isaiah faithfully bringing forth the word of the Lord unto the nation. Moreover, the Lord says, because the uh, because of the uh, of the daughters of Zion, they are haughty. That means they were proud, and they walk with uh, stretch forth necks. They even demonstrated it, and it says, and wanton eyes walking and missing as they go, and it says making a tinkling with their feet. Now, it was the Lord that gave him the message. So what, what could I say a deal? I say I might have said that will not be acceptable to the people. They will not want to hear that. But he said, you know, I'm under obligation. I'm under authority. Here is what the Lord has said. The daughters of Zion are haughty and they walk missing as they go. And it's a revelation of their pride. It says in verse 17, in verse 17, it says is when he says, therefore, the Lord will smite with his calf the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will discover the secret parts. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, in that day, the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments about 
their feet, they even put the jewelry on their feet now, and their, and their cores and their round tires like the moon. Look at verse 19. In verse 19, the chains and the bracelets and the mufflers. In verse 20, it says in verse 20, and the bonnets and the, and the, um, and the ornaments of the legs and the, uh, and the head bands and the tablets and the earrings. Maybe some of the things you just have to wear, but not because of pride. You wear what you wear because you want to cover your nakedness. You wear what you wear because you want to preserve holiness in the land so that you are not wearing something that will show the anatomy, the contour of your body, that will bring any temptation to anybody. The reason why believers dress is that we cover our nakedness decently. We do not cover our nakedness or pride or show with arrogance, with pompous uh, attitude, and then we're moving and doing things that will bring loss and evil things to the heart of the people. In Isaiah chapter 13, we're looking at verse 11. Isaiah chapter 13, verse 11, and I will punish the world, not only Israel, I will punish the world, not only the women, the women and the men, the young and the old. I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their, uh, for their iniquity and will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the uh, of of the people, of the terrible, is that look at an old covenant preacher preaching so clear, preaching so, so plain. Can the new covenant preachers, New Testament preachers, Bible believing preachers preach so clear, so definite that the proud will know their proud? And the proud will know that in their fortunes, the judgment is going to come unto them. Look at chapter 14, verse 12. In chapter 14, verse 12 of Isaiah, is telling us now about Lucifer. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou caught down to the ground, which deeds weaken the nations? Look at verse 13. In verse 13, for thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend unto heaven. Even if somebody does not manifest it openly and it's not revealed to our neighbors in the heart, that's what Lucifer did. That's how Lucifer started. He had the pride and the haughtiness and the arrogance. He had it in the heart. And then he said to himself, I will ascend unto heaven. I will, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Look at the next verse there. That's verse 14. I will also ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. I will be like the most high. I'm not going to be under the control of the most high. I'm not even going to be beside the Most High as the Son, His only begotten Son, is sitting by His side. I will rise above the Most High. That was the pride. And the Lord said, He'll bring him down. And He brought him down. If the Lord can do that to the highest of the angels, what do you think about man? What do you think about woman? He will rebuke pride. He will judge pride. The condemnation of revealed pride. We need to examine ourselves. Like I say, I examined himself. And he saw that I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of the people of unclean lips before the cleansing came 
came before the purging came. Look at number three here. Number three is the cleansing through the redemptive purging, a kind of purging, a kind of cleansing, a kind of purifying that is redemptive, that redeems us, redeems us and takes, takes us away from the punishment of sin, takes us away from the pollution and the defilement of the sins we have committed, the purging that takes place, and it takes place not because we're in the denomination that preaches sanctification is a personal sin, it's a passionate sin that we have to go to the Lord, like he was passionate about it, and he wanted the purging and the purifying. We must desire, we must hunger and thirst after his righteousness before we can be filled. The cleansing through the redemptive purging. It tells us in Isaiah chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 5. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 5, Then said, I woe is me, for I am undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips. I am, I am a man of unclean lips. Before you point accusing fingers to Isaiah, think about what comes out of your mouth, the slander, the lie, the deception, the insult, the abuse, the uh, kind of insulting language you use on other people and so that, you know, you'll not be under their control. Once you can insult them with impunity and it's like you have, uh, you know, that high position, they know they cannot talk to me and they cannot touch me because of the rotting language you speak to them. And think of your friends, the kind of, you know, uh, con conversation you have and the kind of uh, insulting uh, thing uh, you both uh, may be, you know, talking about against another person. And here, uh, so I said, what is me? The confession must come before the cleansing. Re repentance must come before the redemption. What is me? For I am uh, undone because I am a man of unclean lips and because I dwell in the midst of a people of, a, of unclean lips for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Now, the vision did not make Isaiah proud. The vision of the glory of God, of the holiness of God, of the angels of God did not make Isaiah Pompous. You see, that's what vision do to the unregenerate heart. The people who do not know the Lord, the people who are not cleansed, the people who are not born again, the people that do not have their nature changed. Once they see an angel, they think they are above everybody. Once they see a vision, a great dream about God and about, you know, the holy angels of heaven, they become proud. But in the case of Isaiah, the vision made him to see his own sinfulness. The vision made him to see his own depravity. And therefore, he was able to confess, woe is me. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, after that confession, then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with a uh, Tongues from up the altar. And then in verse 7, in verse 7, and he laid each upon my mouth. That thing was hot. It was like coal from the altar of the Lord and laid it upon his mouth. He didn't dodge it. That thing might be painful. Sometimes the, the message comes straight to you and penetrates your heart and penetrates and, and uh, declare open, throw open uh, everything in your life. We don't dodge because of that. He brings the coal of fire. He brings the life coal so that we can be purged, so that we can be purified, so that our lives will turn around. If we want the end result, we must want the process that gets Gets us to the end result. And then he said, Then iniquity is taken away, and I see no purge. It tells us in chapter 51 of, of the Psalm, Psalm 51, reading here from verse 5 Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, that the depravity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, we're told, Behold, thou desirest truth. 
in the inward parts. David was saying, I know what you want, O oh God. It's not just something external. You desire truth in the inward part. And Lord, I confess, I don't have the truth in the inward part. When I wrote that letter and I gave it to Arias, and I said, give it to Joab. And when you give it to Joab, he'll know what to do. He wasn't having truth in the inward part. He knew he wanted to kill the man to cover up his adultery. He knew when he confessed, I do have this. You desire, you demand truth in the inward part. And in the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Look at verse 7. In verse 7, he has the plan of purge me with his soap and I shall be clean wash me and I shall be whiter than snow he needed that he needed that he knew he must have that before he could get to heaven before he could dwell in the high mountain of the Lord look at verse 8 in verse 8 it says make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice verse 9 in verse 9 it says hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my transgressions verse 10 in verse 10 creation me a clean heart oh god that's prayer that's prayer a person who knows he has uh, gone astray a person who knows he has been defiled a person knows he has defiled other people a person knows he has even taken the life of another one he wasn't covering up anything he said how could i do that only crooked heart could have done that only defiled in a man could have done that. Only a dubious, deceptive man could have done what he did unto Orias. And therefore he said, I need a new heart. I must have a new heart. There must be cleansing. There must be purging. He said, create in me a clean heart of God and renew a right spirit within me. Then in verse 11, in verse 11 he says, cast me not away from thy presence says and make not that and take not the holy spirit for me in verse 12 he says restore unto me the joy of thy salvation he lost relationship with god he lost fellowship with god he lost the life god had given him but now he descended to the valley of human depravity. And now he said, I need that salvation again. I need that joy of salvation again. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. In verse 13, he says, Then, after the cleansing, then, after the purging, then, after the salvation, then after the restoration you see there are people they say it doesn't matter i'll settle it later i don't have the joy of salvation i don't have the victory of salvation i do not have i don't have any testimony now even the people like joab that i sent that letter to he knows he knows he knows my state my spiritual state but never mind never mind i keep on walking i keep on laboring i keep on toiling i keep on preaching not david david said restore unto me the joy of thy salvation then will i teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee in second timothy chapter 2 reading from verse 19 second timothy chapter 2 verse 19 nevertheless the foundation of god standeth sure having this seal the lord knoweth them that are his and let everyone that nameth the name of christ depart from iniquity look at verse 21 in verse 21 he said if a man therefore purge himself well we we'll pray that god should have should purge us you must desire that purging the purging from fleshly lost you must desire 
that purging. You, you cannot be looking at pornography and then after after the pornography and then you need a Lord purge me. He knows why not to sin. He knows that's just the prayer that somebody wrote in the book and then we're repeating that. He knows that's the kind of prayer that's stuck in our memory and we're just repeating. If we're going to pray that God should purge us and God should cleanse us and God should prepare us as a holy vessel unto him. We ourselves must get rid of everything that God needs to purge away in our lives. If a man therefore purge himself from this, it shall be a vessel unto honor sanctified you see that sanctified and meet and suitable and fit for the master's use and prepared unto every good work we'll come to point number two here point number two we're looking at the coming the crucifixion and the conquest of the prince now isaiah preached the full message his first coming his crucifixion, his conquest, and his second coming. He preached everything. It wasn't a man that would choose and select, okay, I'll preach that. People will be happy with that. But this one, this passage that talks about sins, about sin, about depravity, about evil, about the need of cleansing, about hell, about heaven. I have to be careful now. People like this, they don't like this. Isaiah was not like that. Isaiah has given us everything that we need to know. If we're going to be like Isaiah, if we're going to become another Isaiah, if we're going to be the Messiah's prophet, we must dig into the word of God and preach everything that is revealed in the word. We're looking at three things here. Number one is the coming of the Prince of Peace. Number two, the crucifixion of the Prince of Life. Number three, the conquest over the Prince of Peace. Power. Look at number one. Number one is the coming of the Prince of Peace. It tells us in Isaiah chapter 9, reading from verse 6. It says, For unto us a child is born. That's his coming, coming to this world. And unto us a son is given at Calvary. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God. God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He said, He is coming. Then look at verse 7. In verse 7, it says, Of the increase of His kingdom, it says, And of the peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon the kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall perform this. He is the Prince of Peace. And Isaiah spoke about his coming into this world. It tells us in chapter Isaiah chapter 53, we're reading from verse 5. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 5, but was wounded for our transgressions. He was, that's his crucifixion. He was, uh, he was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace. Our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. In Luke chapter 2, reading from verse 11. In Luke chapter 2, reading from verse 11, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And the Lord Jesus Christ, when was born, the angels announced, and the angels rejoiced that Christ the Savior 
Christ, the Prince of Peace, has been born. And then he tells us in verse 12, in verse 12 he says, And they shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe, he was just born, that is coming to the earth, the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, and lying in a manger. Verse 13, verse 13 says, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying in verse 14, in verse 14, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. He is the Prince of Peace. And Isaiah spoke about the coming of the prince of priests. Not only that, he spoke about his crucifixion. Come to number two here. The crucifixion of the prince of life. The prince of life. When he brought peace, he also brought life, eternal life, abundant life. He tells us in Isaiah chapter 53, and we're reading from verse 3. Here is the proclamation of Isaiah. He tells us in chapter 53, verse 3, it says, He's despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and esteemed, we esteemed him not. In verse 4, it says, in verse 4, surely he has borne our griefs, our punishment. He has borne our suffering and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and that's because he became a substitute. The sin we had, he carried the sin. The sin we committed, he carried the sin. He bore the consequence of our sin, of yours, of mine, and of the whole world. And our iniquity was laid upon him. He was afflicted. Look at verse 5. In verse 5 he says, but he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity and the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed look at verse 6 and you see here we have we uh, all we like sheep have gone astray and uh, we have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him on Christ, the iniquity of us all. At the beginning of the verse, all. And at the end of the verse, all. It says, all the sins of humanity, all the sins from generation to generation, Christ suffered for everything. And now all that weight was laid upon him. Isaiah spoke about his crucifixion. It tells us in Acts chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 15. Acts chapter 3, verse 15, and he killed the prince of life. Is the prince of peace, is the prince of life, killed the prince of life whom God has raised from the dead whereof we are witnesses. In verse 16, and his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong whom ye see and know ye the faith which is by him has given him his perf days, perfect soundness in the presence of you all crucified, crucified. He was crucified and that was prophesied and proclaimed by Isaiah. In Romans chapter 6, we're reading from verse 6. Romans Chapter 6, verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. It's great for you to know that Christ was crucified. You must go beyond that.
that. You must come to the point, you yourself, you identified what Christ in crucifixion. And you know that the depravity within you, this is why you can be free. This is how you can be free. And this uh, very root of your freedom in the Lord. Knowing this, you know this, number one, in the knowledge that you have in the Bible. You know this, number two, in the personal experience you have in the Lord. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that, that, that the body of sin might be destroyed, and that henceforth we should not serve sins. We should not be, we should not remain the servants of sin because the root of sin, the depravity, the origin, the false Adam in us, that sin has been destroyed because we're crucified with Christ. And it says in verse 11, in verse 7, in verse 7, for he that is dead is freed from sin. In Galatians chapter 2, you reading from verse 20. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. When you know it in a personal way, when you've gone to the Lord and you definitely knelt down, if you're not leaning down physically, your heart, your mind, your inner man is kneeling down, is pleading before the Lord, is identifying with the crucified Christ. And you have a definite experience that you you, your inner man, your personality, the very root of your life, crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The Lord did not stay on the cross. He went to the grave. He didn't say in the grave. He rose again triumphantly and victoriously. And he said, yes, I'm crucified with Christ, but Christ is not on the cross anymore. But he is on the right hand side of the heavenly father. And I abide with him. I identify with him. And that Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the face of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He loved me and gave himself for me. And if I'm going to have the benefit of giving his life for me or being crucified for me, I must not be dead unto sin and alive unto God. I must not allow any sin or appearance of sin to darken the threshold of my chamber, of my heart, of my life. I must demonstrate the experience I have with the Lord that I am crucified with him. And then in number three, we're looking at the conquest over the prince of power. Who is the prince of power? Uh, that, uh, you read that in Ephesians chapter 2. Look at Ephesians chapter 2 from verses 1 and 2. And you at he quickened, made alive, made a conqueror, made victorious, who was dead, was dead, was past tense dead, in trespasses and sins. Look at verse 2. In verse 2 it says, wherein in time past, he walked according to the cause of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. That, that Satan being referred to as the prince of the power of the air. And when Jesus died, he crushed him. When Jesus died, he knocked him off. When Jesus died, he destroyed the power. He conquered the power of the devil who makes the people to do things they shouldn't be doing. It says, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now walketh in the children of disobedience. Those children of disobedience, they have not gone to Christ, they have not met Christ. They might go to church, they might be religious, but they have not been to the Lord that destroys the power of that prince away from their lives. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 2, and I'm reading here from verse 14. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14, for as much 
then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood he also referring to christ himself himself likewise took part of the same that that through death is death on the cross of calvary he might destroy him that had the power of death that is the devil and then in verse 15 here is what christ has done by dying for us on the cross of calvary and delivered them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject unto bondage in first john chapter 5 reading from verse 18 first john chapter 5 verse 18 we know that whosoever in any church whosoever in any denomination whosoever in any generation whosoever among men women boys girls whosoever is born of god sinners not whosoever is born of god has the grace for one day to live free from sin and if you can live free from sin one hour 24 hours one day you can live free from sin the following day the grace of god is available the grace of god is sufficient that you can resist the devil and it will flee from you it says we know we know by experience we know by the witness of the spirit of god in us we know by the spirit showing light shining light on the scriptures we know by personal experience we know that whosoever is born of god sinneth not but he that is begotten of god keepeth himself keepeth himself keepeth himself and that wicked one toucheth him not we're coming to point number three point number three we're looking at the consecration the confirmation and the continuation of the prophet the prophet i said remember we're talking about becoming another i say the messiah's prophet that will be able to stand stand tall stand firm stand courageously and know that i say is gone but god wants to raise up and i say out of you that will preach everything the word of God has that will tell the world about the corruption of the world, the condemnation of the world, and about the cleansing we can have through the word and the blood of Christ. You must be able to stand and declare also about the coming of the Lord. He has come. And you must be able to tell why. He came so that he can cleanse us from sin, save us from sin, convert our heart, our life life away from sin we must you must remind the people they know the story but they need to have the spiritual experience of the crucifixion of christ and then the conquering power of christ over the tempter and now we talk about isaiah's consecration isaiah's confirmation and then the continuation of that prophet we're coming to, uh, to three things here number one we're coming to the consecration of sanct of the sanctified prophet number two the confirmation of his scriptural prophecy number three the continuity the continuation of his steadfast promises we're looking at number one number one we're looking at the consecration of sancti of the sanctified prophet look at isaiah chapter six reading from verse eight and i heard the voice of the lord and i heard the voice of the lord and you know sometimes you'll call a person and the fellow is thinking it might be demanding days from me 
especially you know you can call on phone and the fellow sees uh, you know your name and he is not with you in the physical he is not in the room where you are he's not in the office where you are so he will not know whether you you know see the call or not he might think that your phone is far away from you there are people they receive calls they don't answer i say I might have uh, you know just turn a deaf ear it's calling you i say in me alone when i'm ready i'll answer you. there are people that do like that with god it's going to demand this of me and they block the call but i say do not block the call i heard the voice of the lord saying whom shall i send and who will go for us then said i the man knew the purpose of his purging. The man knew the purpose of his being purified. He knew the purpose of the revelation the vision had given unto him. He said, this is the climax, this is the consequence, and this is the consummation of everything the Lord has revealed to me. He knew that call must come, and that call came after God favored him and showed him that revelation and so he answered here am i send me here am i send me he was going to talk about christ in chapter 50 i'm reading there from verse 7 in isaiah chapter 50 verse 7 it says for the lord god will help me therefore have i not therefore shall i not be confounded therefore have i set my face like a flint and i know that i shall not be ashamed he was speaking about the lord when the lord will come the lord will set his face like a flint distractions will not divert him Whatever the people did or said, they might call him a bad name. They might say he's working with Beelzebub. He would, he would just give them allowance to say whatever they wanted to say. They might, uh, you know, smite him on the one cheek. He'll turn the other onto them. Because he'll not allow the smiting, the spitting, the insult, the bad, false news will not allow anything to divert him. He set his face as a flint. If you read Isaiah chapter 1 verse 1, he tells you that uh, Isaiah was there a prophet in the reign of one king and second king and third king and fourth king and the name of the fifth king, Manasseh. They didn't even write there because he laid and preach and ministered in the reign span of five kings. And so he had to set his face as a flint. And the consecration he had at the beginning, he had to keep that consecration until the end. Uh, because he set his face as a flint, which prophesied about Christ. And of course, he was like Christ himself. And then Paul came later in Acts chapter 20, verse 24. Acts chapter 20, verse 24, he said, But none of these things move me. None of these things distract me. None of these things divert me. None of these things will make me to go away from the calling. If you're a real child of God, a real minister of God, a real prophet of God, if you are another Isaiah today, here is what is important to you, the calling God has given, and then you match your consecration with your calling. And so you'll not be diverted, and you say, here am I, send me. After two years, we're still available. After 10 years, we're still available, on and on, until you breathe your last you're still available. You're able to say, like Paul the Apostle, none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish 
my cause for joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. We're coming to number two here. Number two, we're looking at the confirmation of his scriptural prophecy. His word, his prophecy, his proclamation was confirmed. In Matthew chapter 8, we're reading from verse 16, it says, And when the evening was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed of devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word, and healed all that were sick. Look at the confirmation, verse 17, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. This was about 700 years after Isaiah had spoken, but his word was confirmed. Look at chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, we're looking at verse 17. It says that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. Verse 18, saying behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. The word of Isaiah was fulfilled, it tells us in. It tells us in John chapter 12, we're reading from verse 38. John chapter 12, verse 38, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled. Confirmation, confirmation that the saying of Isaiah the prophet may be fulfilled, which is speak, Lord, who has believed our report and to whom the arm of the Lord revealed. Then he tells us in verse 39, in verse 39, therefore they could not believe because Isaiah said again, in verse 40, in verse 40 he said again, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes no understand with their heart and be converted and should heal them let's talk about the pharisees and the sadducees and i say i prophesied concerning them he knew what they would do he knew what their attitude will be and his word was confirmed Confirm. I was looking at Romans chapter 15, reading from verse 12. Romans chapter 15, verse 12, it says, And again, Isaiah said, well, The life of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus, everything is said about him, fulfilled and confirmed. And then with the apostles, everything is said about the ministry, fulfilled again. Isaiah said, There shall be a root. Of J out of Jesse, and he that shall rise and reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust. In him shall the Gentiles trust. In verse 13, verse 13 tells us now, the God of hope fill you all with joy fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the holy ghost we're coming to number three here number three we're talking about the continuation the continuity of his steadfast promises the continuity of his steadfast promises you see i see i did not only give prophecy proclamation he also gave prophecy he also gave promises and those promises were steadfast and so as you preach as you understand the lord can make an isaiah out of you today and you proclaim the word of god faithfully 
honestly, earnestly, you expect that the promises of God you are bringing to the people will be continued, will be confirmed as well. In Isaiah chapter 40, reading from verse 28, Isaiah chapter 40, we're looking at uh, verse uh, 28. Has thou not known, has thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the heavens and the earth, fainteth not, neither is he weary. There is no searching of his understanding. In verse 29, verse 29, he giveth power. He giveth power. That's the promise of the Lord given by Isaiah. And that promise is still valid today. He gave power to the apostles. He gave power to Philip. And he that was scattered abroad went everywhere preaching. He gave power to them. He gave power to Stephen. He gave power to the people that waited upon the Lord. He shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria to the uttermost part of the earth. He giveth power to the faint and to them that have no might. He increases strength. Look at verse 30. In verse 30 it says, Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. Verse 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles, and then it says, they shall run and not be weary. They shall run and not be weary. They are asli, asli athletes. They run, they run, they run. Some of them get weary before the end of the race. If they're running a marathon, some of them can get weary and just collapse and cannot stand up. Some of them, if they're running country around, uh, you know, race, some of them in the middle, even the third quarter, are just weary and they fall down. But the spiritual race that we're running, we can run another 20 years. We can run another 30 years. You know what we need to do when you're running and running? I mean, spiritual race. I mean, this progressive race. All you need to do if you're getting tired, if your oil is getting about dry, if it appears that, you know, you are breathing as if you are passing out, stay right there and wait upon the Lord. And wait and wait and wait upon the Lord. Then it says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They will renew your strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Your Lord say good. Amen. In Isaiah chapter 43, reading there from verse 2, Isaiah 43 verse 2, it says, When thou passest through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. And when thou walkest through the fire, they shall not burn thee you will not be burnt. And then it says, Neither shall the flame kindle upon me. The attitude of, you know, people, they are facing God, but when faith is low and they are passing through the fire, they run, they haste, they make haste so that they can get out of that fire in good time. But no, it says, When thou walkest through the fire because you know the fire really is nothing the creator of the heavens and the earth said i will be with you i'll never leave you i never forsake you you don't have to hurry you don't have to make it you don't have to run just walk just walk shadrach meshach and abednego the fourth man the son of god will be with you 
Look at verse 7. In verse 7, it says in verse 7, even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory, and I have formed him, yea, I have made him. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Verse 19, in verse 19, behold, I will do a new thing. In your ministry, I will do a new thing. In your calling, I will do a new thing. And now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Look at verse 21. In verse 21, these people have I formed for myself. Thank God I am not made for Satan. I am not made for the wicked. I'm not, way, I'm not made for Mr. Terrible. He said, these people, who are the people? Where are they? He has made you for his glory. He has made you for his praise. And everything he had in mind, when you are born, and when you are born again, and when you are blessed again, you will fulfill in Jesus' name. I look at uh, chapter 60 of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 60, from verse 1, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. In verse 2, in verse 2 it says, For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and cross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, violence shall no more be heard in thy land, in thine house, in thy family, wasting nor destruction within thy borders in your compound. But thou shalt call thy walls salvation and thy gates praise. Verse 19. In verse 19, the sun shall be no more thy light by day, neither for brightness shall the moon Give thee light, give unto thee light, but the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light, and thy God thy glory. Verse 20, in verse 20, it says, Thy sun shall no more go down, neither shall thy moon withdraw itself, for the Lord shall be thine everlasting light. And the days of mourning, of sorrow, of suffering, of regret shall be ended. In verse 21, verse 21, that people also shall be all righteous. They shall inherit the land forever. And the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. Verse 22. In verse 22, a little one shall become a thousand. That little church will grow. That little house fellowship will grow. That little assembly will grow. And a small one, a strong nation, I, the Lord, will hasten it in his time. 
chapter 65, verse 17. Isaiah 65, verse 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. I'll be there. I will be there. And the former shall not be remembered nor come into mine. Now we're going to pray. Before we pray, let's look at verse 24. I see a 65, verse 24, and it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. Here are promises, and I say, and these promises are steadfast. Look at everything the Lord has revealed unto us so that you understand if you're going to be another Isaiah today, another Elijah today, another Ezekiel today, another Joel today, another apostle today, another saint one today, you know what you are getting to. The Lord will never leave you. He'll never forsake you. And everything he has promised in his word will be yes and amen in your life. Amen. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer. Rise up. Let's talk to the Lord in prayer. He wants to make of you a confident preacher, a confident pastor, a confident leader, a confident prophet, like I say. Speak to the Lord. You know where he began? He began when he saw the vision of the Lord. And he confessed what he was, what he had done, how he had spoken. He confessed and made an absolute surrender unto the Lord. And the Lord cleansed him, purged him, purified him, redeemed him, made him righteous. Tell the Lord, is the same God, the God of yesteryears, and the God of today. The God of the past, the God of the present, and the God of the future. Purge me with the blood of the Lamb. Purify. Wash me. And I'll be whiter than snow. No corruption. No corruption in your mouth. No corruption in your character. No corruption, your conversation, communication. The depravity that causes corruption, the depravity that makes a man, a woman to be a corrupter, the Lord takes away. Those prophets of old were used by the Lord because they surrendered themselves to purging to 
total redemption they surrender themselves to crystal cleansing by the Lord Cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, cleansed internally, cleansed outwardly, cleansed from revealed pride. Cleansed from all filthiness, cleansed from the corruption of society. Mind cleansed, heart cleansed, your spirit, your inner man cleansed, Only then can your consecration be acceptable to God after cleansing. Whom shall I send? Who shall go for us? Called by the Father. Commissioned by the Son, consecrated through the Spirit. Whom shall I send? Have you heard the voice of the Lord? Do you position yourself in a state of mind? You can really hear from the Lord. Whom shall I send? Are you humble enough? Free from the pride of Lucifer. That you can hear from the Lord. Whom shall I send? Are you so tired with the present assignment that when God calls, you turn a deaf ear? I don't want to hear again. I've heard enough. I don't want to go again. I've traversed enough. Are you deaf? To the voice from heaven, do you deaden yourself to the voice of heaven? I 
Isaiah was open. Isaiah was attentive. Isaiah was submissive. Here am I. Here am I. He was not in a corrupting place where God will say, I can't choose a man like that. I can't choose a woman like that. Here am I. Where are you? Are you in a place that noise is so much you cannot hear? And he might talk to you in a whisper. Here am I. Send me. He didn't know where he would be sent. Send me. He didn't know what the commission will entail. Send me. He didn't know the people will be sent to, whether they are hard people or soft people, whether they're people blinded by hatred or people softened by eager desire. Didn't know, here am I, send me. Then he went forth and spoke about the coming of Christ. A child is born. A son is given. He went ahead and spoke about the crucifixion of Christ and what that crucifixion means to every believer. Are you taking the whole gospel? about the coming of Christ, about the crucifixion of Christ, about the conquest of Christ? And are you still holding on to that as long as you live? Commit yourself to the Lord. willing to take the great commission to every place the Lord will send you. The consecration the confirmation Say nothing that God will not want to confirm. Your own thought, your own imagination, your own ideology, God will not confirm that. So when you go forth and speak, the word he has given. That's when there will be a confirmation. Since you forth the message of repentance, redemption, restitution, righteousness. That's what he will confirm. The word of faith. Look unto me, all ye the ends of the earth, and be saved. That's what you will confirm. And the continuation of the steadfast promises. Wait on the Lord. He renew your strength. 
wait on the Lord. Let's change your weakness for strength. Wait on the Lord. Don't be a hearer only, but a doer of the word. Wait. I say on the Lord. Then will you run and not be weary? Then will you walk and not faint? Believe his promises. Then will you walk through fire and it will not burn you. Then will you realize that he made you for his glory. Then will you experience he will do a new thing. Then will he make a way for you in the wilderness. Then will a small one become a thousand. Then will the weak one become a strong nation. Wait on the Lord. while you're still speaking then will he hear the cleansed from the ways of the past become a new creation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your revealed desire that what you made of faithful people Effective people, fiery people, fruitful people, prophets of old, you want to make of every one of us. Lord, we submit ourselves without reservation. Do in us what you want to do and help us to be faithful witnesses today in every community in Jesus' name. Pardon the past. Purify our hearts. Empower, fill every vessel. That Lord, without weariness, weariness from walking in the strength, in the energy of the flesh, without weariness, will go forth in the strength and the power in the virtue of the Lord, in Jesus' name. We have a world before us to conquer, to penetrate, to preach to. Lord, open our eyes, open our ears, open our mouth, that we will go forth in the strength and the anointing and the power of the Lord and do exploits for you in Jesus' name. Amen. That multitudes in their millions will turn to the Lord. Amen. That glory, honor will rise, praise will rise from every part of the world that was scattered to and their conversion will bring glory unto you in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, 
give us new strength, new vision, new power, new anointing, fresh focus, that multitudes will hear the word from our mouth and know the Lord. And Lord, when you come back, there will be thousands and millions following in after us that will say, but were it not for the coming and the preaching and the proclamation of this brother, that sister, where would I be? Lord, bring fruit to everyone's labor. Thank you, Lord. Help us not to look back, not to draw back, not to slide back, but to keep on moving and moving and moving, prevailing in the great ministry you have, converted, you have committed into our hands. Thank you, Lord. It is done. We shall see continuing results in every life. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Yeah.